thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your love. We thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming down and dying on the cross for us, our cross. We thank you that it's all about you. History belongs to you. And you've elected us to be yours and to be image bearers of your glory at this moment in time. We want to be faithful friends. We want to be dedicated disciples. We want to bring honor to your name. We live in an American culture where we don't really understand honor. We don't really understand shame the way other cultures do. But you're here to renew our minds even here. We want to honor you and bring you honor. It's all about you, Lord. Forgive us for in any ways where we make it about us in any way. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. We're here, Lord, to worship you. And we're here to be conformed into the image of the one we worship. So speak to us from your word. We thank you for those online. We thank you for the family. We thank you for Antioch. We thank you for everything you've given us. Lord, protect us. Continue to protect us. Be a wall of fire about us. We plead your blood upon everything. And we just dedicate everything to you all over again. Speak to us from your word. Let it go into our hearts. And do what needs to be done. It's good to be here. It's good to be at your feet. Please, Holy Spirit, bring us fire from heaven. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 So again, Hebrews 12 is where we're going to be today, among other places. And the title of the message is, Bruh, Quit Talking About Quitting. Right? The heart, the Bible says, is desperately wicked, Right? deceitful above all things. Jesus said, out of the heart flows adultery, thefts, and murders, and fornications because of Adam and Eve's rebellion in the garden. Not only do we physically die, not only are we born spiritually separated from our creator, but our hearts also are rebellious, and not just rebellious, but rebellious to where we even like the rebellion. We're fallen creatures, but praise God that by the new birth, we now have received a new nature, and as we cooperate with the Spirit of God, God is faithful, Philippians 1, 6, to finish what he started in us. We did not choose him, but he chose us, John 15, 16, and he will finish in us what he's begun. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, faithful is he who was called you, faithful is he who will do it. Philippians 1, 6, he will finish what he started. Jude 24, unto him who will keep us from falling and to present us spotless, a.k.a. unimpeachable before the Father with joy. Amen. So as we're here to receive, to receive, we're redeemed, but in unredeemed bodies. We have a new nature, but we still have that old nature that lusts or wars against the new nature. And it's like the Native American Christian once said when describing the two different natures that were at war and so diametrically opposed within him. He said, there's two dogs fighting inside of me. Someone then asked him, well, which dog is winning? His response was, whichever dog I feed, right? So as we come before the Lord, as we get in his word, as we worship, as we do the things that the Spirit of God leads us to do that point to Jesus, singing, worshiping, praying, reading, 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 reading the scriptures, we are feeding that nature. But the old nature is still there, isn't it? Wouldn't it be awesome if when you got saved, the old nature just left? <laughs> I mean, it's like, yo, uh, are you saved? Is the person saved? And they're like, yep, old nature's gone. Haven't had one selfish thought in one year. You know, haven't had one lustful, crazy thought in one year. Haven't had one negative thought. Haven't had one bad dream. Nature's gone. Uh, all I care about is heaven. You know what I mean? Never get tempted to look at the world. Never get tempted to settle down here. You know, I'm born again. But that's not what it is. The Lord could have made it that way. But in his infinite wisdom, 
He has designed it so that he gets to show off his glory and we get to show our devotion to him and how we, 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith every day. Someday you take a one-two. Someday you might feel like you take like a Tyson punch to the head. You know what I mean? That old nature can come in strong and coupled with the enemy. It could be just be like a lighter fluid right on the fire, but we show our devotion to him. That's why the scripture says a righteous man falls seven times and continues to get back up. We show our devotion to him in that. But as this battle gets tough, if all of us were to be honest and share some of the secrets in these wicked hearts of ours, we would all be honest and say that we think about quitting. We would all be honest and say that we think about quitting. If it's not quitting the race altogether, it's maybe quitting that ministry. It's quitting, you know, we maybe just want to whittle it down. You know, last year you were so excited that you could identify five areas where God had called you. And you told people, I know he's told me to do this. I know he's told me to do that. Then your heart's kind of like, well, I hope you didn't tell too many people that because like if you started fading out, you think people will remember that you said, you know, God told you to do that. You know, it's either being tempted to quit altogether, being tempted to just kind of quit a few things, being tempted to just quit the things that make us the most uncomfortable in the Christian walk. But it only makes our flesh uncomfortable. You know, our spirit man actually is thriving in those circumstances. Whatever it is, all of us wrestle with the temptation to quit to walk away altogether, maybe just to quit coming to church on Sundays, maybe just I'll come to church Sundays, but I'll just quit serving in that ministry. Uh, Instead of those three that I know God called me to, I'll just slowly whittle it down to a one. Now all of a sudden we're more concerned with what humans remember than whether we're faithful to God or not. But as long as we fool the people, we forget that the one we're really going to stand before is the Lord, Hebrews 4.13. We all struggle with the same struggles. That's why I love that it says in James chapter 5, even Elijah was a man of like passions as us. Even one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament was a man of like passions. It means he got tempted in the exact same ways as us, had the exact same evil nature. But the Bible says he prayed, but he continued in the things of the Spirit. It says in Corinthians, there's no temptation that takes you, but what's common to all of mankind. There's no struggle. There's no lying whisper in your ear about compromising your walk that hits you that doesn't hit every member of the body of Christ, no matter where they are. But the bottom line is this. The word of God is here to remind us that quitting is not an option. The Bible is here to remind us that God is our enabler, that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And again, the title of today's message, bruh, quit talking about quitting, all right? Hebrews is an interesting book. The author is anonymous. So some of you, I'm even looking at my Cambridge Bible right now, it's telling me that the Epistle of Paul, the Apostle to the Hebrews. Now, the titles of the books, the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. But the titles of the books was added later. So if you see that in your Bible and Paul actually isn't the author, no, that doesn't mean that's not inspired. The titles are not inspired. Only the Word of God is the inspired Word of God. The titles are added by editors who are just trying to help our referencing. So it says here that Paul wrote Hebrews. I don't want to get in this for too long, but how many of you think that Paul wrote Hebrews? I used to really be a proponent of Paul having written Hebrews and then thought that because he was a convert from such a high rank in Judaism, that God in his wisdom left it anonymous so that maybe Jewish Christians and Jews could read it without stumbling at Paul or, you know, and just see it for what it was. I I actually, that was my, my reasoning. And then I've done a deeper study on Hebrews, and here's some interesting things about Hebrews. Hebrews is written unlike any other book in the New Testament. 
what Hebrews is presenting is Jesus Christ as our high priest. That means, think of all of the terms that mean safety in your life. Having a big bro in your corner, having a big sis in your corner, having a bodyguard, having a life coach, you know, uh, having the friend that sticks closer than a brother, having a representative, having an advocate. All of that is encapsulated in what it means when we say Christ is our high priest and even more because the high priest became a lamb and died for all of us. You following me? The theme of Hebrews is presenting Christ as our high priest. Hebrews is written interestingly because it's being written to Jewish Christians who were going through hardship, and they were getting tempted to go back to the more comfortable, um, more predictable uh, system of sacrificing animals again. They were through hardship. They were going through hard times. The Jewish Christians in the book of Hebrews were going through hard times, right? We're going to make parallels because us here in Philadelphia are going through hard times. Believers today are going through hard times. Because of the hard times, they were being, te- being hit with the temptation, and some even were, quitting. They were going back to the animal sacrifice system. They were going back to the mosaic way of doing things. They were going back to the things of the old covenant. That's what the hardship was doing to them. They were slowly trimming them sa- their sails and backing up. Is there anyone here today that just because of the warfare with being a believer, just because of the, the, the attacks and the battle and how it seems like the closer you get to the Lord, the more your flesh roars, the more your flesh squeals like a pig, you know, that you're just being tempted to just try to find this quote unquote happy medium where you could just trim the sails a little bit and go back. We're seeing that happen. I mean, we're seeing some just walk away from the faith altogether, Right? Let me tell you what I think when I see people walk away from the faith. Because what the enemy wants you to think is, man, this many people walking away from the faith? Maybe there's something to this whole thing with walking away. That's not what I see. You want to know what I see? I see that the Bible is even more literal when I see a lot of people walking away from the faith. You know why? Because 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says that in the last days, there would be the great apostasy, the greatest falling away in the church of all time in church history would be in the last days. So when I see people walking away, it doesn't make me start to say, I don't know, one more public Facebook post about a well-known Christian walking away from the faith. I don't know if I can handle another one. Oh, I I pray for that person, but it's just going to make me tremble at the word even more because the Bible said this would happen. But then you have those that don't, they're not walking away from the faith. They're just walking away from this biblical set of doctrines that we all hold dear. So you see people not going back to sacrificing animals, but you'll see some people want to go back to just holding the festivals. You know, it's all about instead of outreach, instead of going out to where we might die for Jesus, instead of injecting ourselves into the world and being incarnational to be salt and light, you know, you just go back into, I just observe all the Jewish festivals now, and that's what it's all about. And I I only worship on Shabbat now, and that's what it's all about. That also can be, and I'm not saying everyone that holds the Jewish festivals is in that place, but I am saying that some are, that's a form of trimming back. They used to be active in a church. They used to be out in the world. They used to be looking for how to be salt and light. And they've just trimmed back and got into all these observances. And praise God for any observance, as long as you see that Christ fulfills it all. But then they go an extra step, and some of them want to actually judge those that aren't keeping the Jewish festivals. Judge those that aren't worshiping on Shabbat or on Saturday instead of Sunday. I got one verse for them, Colossians 2.16 says, let no man judge you in feast day, in holy day, in moons, or in whatever, because it's all a type. It all is fulfilled in Jesus, right? But let's go to Hebrews 10 real quick, and let's just read of what these believers were going through that was making them tempted to want to quit to where the writer of Hebrews had to say, bruh, quit talking about quitting, I'm excited, so I'm jumping all over the place, but let me just go back to saying one thing. I used to think that Paul wrote Hebrews. I used to really believe that, Um, especially because Hebrews has the similar style 
of Ephesians, um, of Colossians, you know, and of Romans, where Paul would write about doctrine, and then he would shift with a therefore and get into doing, right? Romans, you see doctrine, 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 Romans 12, war, therefore present your bodies as a living sacrifice, therefore do. Ephesians, doctrine, 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 then Ephesians 4, 1, therefore, now let's walk worthy of the vocation, let's walk worthy of what we believe. And because Hebrews has a similar thing, whereas in Hebrews 12, it now goes from doctrine, 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 to uh, in light of all of this, let's now cast away the sin that easily besets us and look to Jesus. I really felt that was enough. There's even a mention of someone, the writer, um, receiving compassion because he was in bonds. And I said, well, Paul was in bonds. That's it. Paul wrote it. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Hebrews is written like no other book in the New Testament. Hebrews has 150 Greek words that you won't find in any other books of the New Testament except for in Hebrews. And Hebrews is actually written with a style called Greek rhetoric, where someone would have had to have been extremely well educated in the Greek manner of rhetoric, of presenting. It's a style of of persuasive reasoning that they would call Greek rhetoric. So here's someone that knows the scriptures extremely well, but also is very, very instructed in this argument style. Alexandria, Egypt actually was one of the, not only one of the intellectual epicenters of the then known world, but Alexandria, Egypt specifically taught this style of using this type of rhetoric. And that is why I now believe, and everyone can have their own beliefs, I now believe that Apollos actually wrote Hebrews. And just real quick before we do that, can we just go to Acts 18? Look at this description of Apollos in Acts 18. And again, this is just for us to, you know, it says, you know, in Proverbs, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. It's the glory of princes to find it out. This is just us looking at scripture just to show our love for the word by just trying to connect dots in what God has not revealed to us, right? Um, If you will go to Acts um, 18... Um, And actually, you're going to see the description of Apollos, and it actually is Acts 18, starting at verse 24. And Acts 18, 24 begins this way, and let's just read it together. Then we're going to jump back in, uh, because there's a lot the Lord wants to say to us today on this topic. But look at Acts 18, verse 24, and I'm finally there. It says, and there was a certain Jew named Apollos, Born in Alexandria, which is Egypt, he was an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, and he came to Ephesus. This man, verse 25, was instructed in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. I love that, that even as anointed as he were, he needed discipling. Are you one of those people that you just think your anointing is so heavy and so many people tell you how gifted you are that you're kind of unteachable? Uh, you kind of reach the point where you definitely know how to be polite to everyone, but in your heart of hearts, you, your heart really, when someone's trying to instruct you, your heart's also whispering to you that you don't need to really heed what they're saying. Well, praise God, because Apollos didn't know that. You know, he knew that as an unregenerate man, but he wanted to know the way of Jesus. He, as anointed as he is, he allows two Jews that he meets from Rome, Aquila and Priscilla, to take them and help them out a little bit. It means that he had a blind spot. And what I love is the Bible doesn't even tell us what his blind spots were, but it just says that Aquila and Priscilla saw the anointing on him and pulled him aside and just helped him understand a couple of things more perfectly. He was off in a few ways, and I love how the Bible just honors, you know, whatever it was by not revealing it. And it says in verse 27, and when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive Apollos, who when he was come, he helped them much, which had believed through grace. For verse 28, he mightily convinced the Jews and did so publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. 
So you look at the fact that Apollos is from Alexandria. Alexandria was one of the preeminent places that taught the style of using this Greek rhetoric when presenting a persuasive argument, and Apollos is from um, Alexandria. You see Hebrews and how much scripture it's presenting, even the meatiest parts of the Old Testament. It says that Apollos was mighty in scripture. You look at the fact that there's 150 Greek words used in Hebrews that you will not find anywhere else in the New Testament. I believe it. But we'll find out in glory. All right, look, let's go back to Hebrews 10, verse 32, and let's look at verse 39. So look, now, with the remaining time, we're going to really dive in. Because what's the title of today's message? Bruh, quit talking about quitting, right? Quit talking about quitting. Some of you have already quit coming on Sundays. You better quit talking about quitting. Some of y'all been quitting ministries. You, you, you shaved it down from five to three. Now, I understand if finances at home got a little tight and you had to get another job. I understand if you just had a baby, but if life has actually gotten easier and you got a pay raise and you got more time on your hands, what you cutting down ministries for? And I'm not talking to anybody in particular. I'm just presenting examples. <laughs> Bruh, stop talking about quitting. Once you just, before we even do this, would you just take an inventory of the things you've quit? The things that you used to do for Jesus and you don't do no more? Why? Oh, well, nobody asked me about it. I guess it's cool. I guess they don't miss me. Jesus misses you. Yo, it's too early to quit, bruh. Quit talking about quitting. And this is here to arrest that part of us because the flesh never comes like the flesh. Does your flesh ever show up like, ugh, I'm flesh. Ugh, I'm that. And with mad and morning breath all in your ear, I'm flesh. Be selfish. Quit ministry. Quit. No. It comes however the flesh wants to come, smooth, waxing, eloquent, and theological. Hast God said that thou mustest continue to service this way? Don't want to be a Martha. Oh, yeah, you're right. I don't want to be a Martha. And my attitude is bad. I guess I'm a Martha. I guess I quit. No, Martha didn't quit. Martha just got her head right. See, some of y'all don't need to be quitting. You just need to get your head right. You just need to get your heart right. But see how the flesh comes in and, you know, presents a, a little bit of scripture with a lot of bit of light. Man, let, let's just keep reading. Hebrews 10, and let's start at verse 32. Because again, the writer of Hebrews is writing to, yes, present Christ as our high priest, our enabler, the one who is the author and perfecter of our faith. The reason we're able to do what we're doing but the context was that because of the persecution, because of the hardship these Jewish Christians were going through, many were quitting, they were trimming back and going to even stuff that was just not biblical. And this is for us to take inventory of one, what are the things where I've already quit and let me examine some things and where might the enemy and my own flesh be trying to deceive me to quit now? So let's read Hebrews 10 verse 32, finally jumping into it. He says to them, but call to remembrance the former days, Hebrews 10, verse 32, in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. He's saying, play back the tape, y'all. When you first got illuminated, do you remember when you first got it that you're a sinner and that God loves you so much, he sent his son to die for your sins. And you knew how sinful you were. And your sin, remember when you reached that point where your sin made you nauseous? Remember when your flesh literally had you so just, 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 just worn out and you didn't even want to receive a compliment anymore. All you wanted to know, you didn't want anyone complimenting you. All you wanted was someone to tell you how to find peace in your life. And then you get illuminated. And you taste and see that the Lord is good and that you understand the gospel and your soul gets saved. And then boom, after that, whoever's mentoring you and of course you're reading in the word of God that now he wants to use you and he wants you to be on the varsity team, not the JV team because he has no JV team. And that you're actually going to be playing in the game, not just in a uniform, warming the bench. And that you actually get to be a mouthpiece for God and be the hands and feet of Jesus and all the gifts that you'd used in all, all of your life, now that you give them to the Lord, they don't just become abilities and gifts, they become supernatural spiritual gifts and you get to be a mighty weapon for the kingdom of God in bringing in the kingdom of righteousness and destroying the works of the devil. 
and that when you speak, God's spirit speaks through you. Do you remember when you first got all this? Man, you were like, what can I do? What can I clean? What do you want me to teach? Do you remember you, you know, the way you'd pray before you taught? Because you understood the weight of the glory of it all. And then remember, it, like in the book of Acts, it says when they suffered, they rejoiced that they were considered worthy enough to suffer for the name of the Lord. And then what happens? Things change. Now, you know, Warfare makes you think more about how to find the exit door, how to find a church that maybe doesn't have as much warfare. You ask to teach, it's kind of like, well, you know, if nobody else would do it, serve. Well, remember, remember, remember how early you were when you first found out that you could serve Jesus? But you were early. Remember that? Now it's like, you know, one minute before go time, you know, late. If you're late, it's like, well, hey, man, we need more help. <laughs> you know what I mean? Never mind where our heart's at. We just need more help. He's saying, call to remembrance, Hebrews 10, verse 32, when you were first illuminated, the things you were willing to do for Jesus, the things you were willing to go through for Jesus, the joy, the privilege, the reverence. Amen. Amen. How things can change when we take our eyes off Jesus or have one eye on Jesus and one eye on our own agendas, one eye on Jesus and one eye on our own comfort zone, one eye on Jesus and one eye on the way the world does things, or even in this day, one eye on Jesus and one eye on how people in the church do things, because if I just look for enough people in the church to do the same thing as me, it helps me further justify what I want to do. So he's saying, look, just remember how it used to be, Hebrews 10, 32. Call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. He says more so, verse 33, you were made a gazing stock by reproaches and afflictions. Just remember how in the days, early in the days, your name was slandered. You know, you were reproached. You were excluded from circles. People, you know, who didn't care about the things of God considered you a fool. It might have cost you business relationships. It might have cost you networking. Remember, you, didn't, you found out that there were functions you didn't get invited to and no one had to tell you. You just kind of knew it probably had something to do with the fact that you love Jesus and you love that stuff. But what can happen? You take your eye off Jesus. You have one eye on Jesus and one eye on our comfort zone. One eye on Jesus, one eye on the world. One eye on Jesus and one eye on people in the church doing the same thing. Because if I can find enough people in the church doing the same thing, it helps me justify more of what I want to do. And things change. He's saying, just remember this. Call to remembrance. Because the Holy Ghost does a real work in every one of us when we first get saved. And we know it, and we remember it. And it's like God so <laughs> beautifully loving his own glory in being God knows what he does in a rebellious heart when he first touches that heart to where he could sit back and say to any human being, call to remembrance. I know what I did in your heart. I'm the God of all flesh. There's nothing too hard for me, Jeremiah 32, 27. Call to remembrance. Call to remembrance. There's never a concern of like, well, call to remembrance, but, you know, there's a couple people that are really tough cases. Don't know if you ever really got through to them, Lord. Lord, like, no. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Every human being, I'm God that sits upon a throne. Let all of earth be silent before me, Habakkuk 2.20. Call to remembrance. And then he says, you were made gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, verse 33, and partly while you became companions to them that were so used, you enjoyed not just suffering, but linking up with others who were suffering. You wanted to be where people were really getting down with the get down. Like, yo, man, people are over there praying all night? Yo, what's the address? People are fasting there? What's the address? People are out serving and it's radical and things got a little hectic out there? What's the address? Whereas today, it's kind of like, no, I, no I, I didn't know. Really? You guys were out? and that, that had, No, I didn't know. I really didn't know. I got it late. Lord, forgive me for lying. I got it late. Lord, I'm such a liar. He says, call to remembrance. Verse 34, for you had compassion of me in my bonds. You took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Obviously, something was happening with these Jewish Christians to where they were even losing property because they had chosen the way of Christ. They were not only being ostracized, they were being penalized. And they were counting it joy. 
He says, knowing the reason you were able to do all of this and endure all of this is because you knew, verse 34, in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. You really believed what Jesus said when he said, lay not up your treasures on earth where moth, you know, can corrupt and where thieves can steal, but lay up your treasures in heaven where moth can never corrupt and thieves can never steal. And now he's saying, in light of you now remembering this, verse 35, cast not away your confidence. Recapture that confidence. Recapture what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches and what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your heart. Cast not away your confidence, verse 35, which has a great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience. He's saying, you know what you need again? You need patience. It might help if you put in your margins endurance. You have need of endurance. You're thinking like a sprinter, you know, that only, you know, a a 30-foot dash, you know, like a little kid that, you know, who can run the fastest from this wall? Who could touch that wall first? A red light, green light. You're thinking like this is a kid's game. You want it to be over. You, You just want to, no, this is a marathon. You have need of that patience. You need to come back to that patience. That after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. And it's the same Jesus who said, Anyone that has given up these things on earth, you will receive a hundredfold. Do we still believe that? And then it says in verse 37, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and he will not tarry. And underline this in verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. We live by faith in these promises. We live by faith in who God is. We live by faith in his word that never changes. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Because again, as the writer is writing to these Christians, many of them were falling back. They were either falling back to their radical stance for Jesus, falling back altogether and getting into the Mosaic system, and instead of looking at Jesus as the Lamb of God, slain for the sins of the world, back into just animal sacrifices, just something more predictable, just something just just, just back to monotony, back to safety, right? And he says, if you do that, my soul, and he's speaking, this is, oh, God speaking through him, my soul will have no pleasure in him. But, verse 39, we are not of them who draw back into perdition. What he's saying is, we're not the falling away type. That's what he's saying. Are you the falling away type right now? He says, we're not the falling away type. We're the keep pressing on type. He says, we're not those that draw back into perdition. We're of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Let's go now to Hebrews 12. And that's part one of the message. So now do you see why after sharing that in Hebrews 10, now do you see why in Hebrews 11, what's the next thing he does? He brings up all of these brothers and sisters who just did the supernatural strictly by faith in their enabler. Now, what, this is where humanism comes in. Where humanism comes in, where new age ideology comes in, would be a Hebrews 10 kind of challenge and then saying, hey, in light of that, you better put on your chin strap and get to work. Hey, in light of that, you better dig deep within you, new age, find the strength somewhere inside of you and bring it out. No, that's not what Hebrews 11 goes to. Hebrews 11 goes to what's called the honor roll of faith, but it's faith in what his enabling power does when we, when we believe. Hebrews 11 shows us that faith is not a mere intellectual assent to a set of doctrines, but it's a complete trust in God that energizes one's actions and one's decisions in life. Faith energizes us. If you're just settling for a faith that just gives intellectual assent to a bunch of doctrines, that's not the the, the faith that's, that's listed in Hebrews 11. That's not full biblical faith. Full biblical faith energizes you. Here's a great question for you today. You know, are you energized by what you believe? And if you are, how so? 
Because all you see in Hebrews 11 is verbs. It says, by their faith, they brought. By their faith, someone built. By their faith, someone offered. By their faith, someone went. By their faith, someone blessed. By their faith, someone gave instruction. By their faith, someone chose. Someone kept. Someone passed through. By their faith, someone conquered. Someone administered. Someone quenched. Someone escaped. It's all what faith energized them to do. Our faith should be energizing us. What is your faith energizing you to do? You say you have faith. What is your faith energizing you to do? We show our faith by our works. We're saved by faith without works, but we show our faith by our works. So now Hebrews 12, and today really is kind of this panoramic of Hebrews, even though we're getting into some verses, you know, very intentionally. Now do you see why Hebrews 12 comes in? And this is where we'll spend the remainder of our time. Hebrews 12 comes in and now says, wherefore, or therefore. Then the verses we all know, lift up your heads that are hanging down. Therefore, strengthen your feeble knees. Therefore, get your feet right. Therefore, keep your eyes on Jesus. Therefore, quit talking about quitting, basically. So therefore, after going through all of the saints, and so many of them rather in Hebrews 11, therefore, seeing we're surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus the author or the pioneer and the finisher or the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame or disregarding the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse three, consider Jesus that endured such contradiction, such opposition is the idea of sinners against himself lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. It's accurate to say many, 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 many believers today are wearied and faint in their minds. That's accurate to say. It's also accurate to say that the Bible clearly is teaching that when you don't continue to consider Jesus, to meditate deeply and intently upon Jesus, and what he endured as the God-man who did it without using any of his own divine powers, but faced it simply as a man relying on the power of the Holy Spirit from his good father. And if you take your eyes off what he endured and what opposition he pushed through, you will become faint in your minds. You will become wearied in your minds. Coming to church will seem like the hardest thing in the world. Getting in the car and driving to church after you could drive to Walmart, Whole Foods, Best Buy, Apple Store, Apple Store, Apple Store, coffee shop, Starbucks, 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 every time, and all of that. But yet coming to church, yeah, it will seem like the hardest thing in the world when you take your eyes off Jesus. You know, basically the Bible's saying we could just kind of watch each other's lives and tell who's watching Jesus and who's, who doesn't have their eyes on Jesus. And someone's like, well, what are you talking about? I could quote more scripture than ever. You might just have your eye on theology, on information. But the Bible is more than information. It's revelation because Christianity is not a set of principles. It's a person. Amen. And we can look at our lives and tell who has their eye on Jesus. Doesn't mean we judge one another, but Jesus said, fruit speaks. By their fruits, you will know them. So it's saying, verse 3, consider him. Hebrews 10 said, call to remembrance when you were first illuminated. It's saying, now, consider him that endured such opposition of sinners against himself. Consider what Jesus went through. And he didn't go through it as a sinner in a world of sinners. He did it all for us. He didn't have to. At any moment, read the Gospels and count the moments when Jesus could have just been totally justified and just saying, enough, I'm out, beam me up, Scotty. Right? John chapter 6, 
He's just given the truths of making sure people know they're saved and no one is deceived into thinking they're saved and on their way to a sinner's hell. And he says, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. It says at that point, John chapter 6, verse 66, many turned around and walked away. I believe a heartbroken Jesus looks at his disciples and says, will you go with them too? And that's when Peter says, where can we go? You alone have the words of life. But would he not have been justified in saying, you know what, that's it. You done broke my heart too much. And then the scripture, and then Jesus ascended. And mankind just lived out the rest of their selfish life, stacking chips and popping their collars, and they all went to hell. No, but he didn't do that. He stayed and endured way more than that. Consider him, because he did it all for us. And if you don't consider him, Hebrews 12, 3 makes clear, you will become wearied and faint in your mind. You will act like the littlest thing done for God is a favor for the universe. You will find far from your lips what the psalmist said when he said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. I'd rather just hold doors open in God's house than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Verse 4 comes in and speaks to these believers who were talking about quitting. He comes in with the encouragement to say, bro, quit talking about your quitting. Verse 4, he says, think about it, y'all. You've not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. Right? Everybody acting like we're losing arms and we're losing kidneys. So you ain't resisted unto blood in the fight against sin. Consider Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane as he was under such emotional duress that it is actually a medical phenomenon that when under extreme emotional duress, the capillaries in your blood vessels rupture and you actually begin to sweat blood. That's even before his skin was shredded by the Roman tortures and before he was nailed to the cross. It's saying, you who are acting like coming to church is so hard. You acting like serving, and oh, you didn't like the way someone talked to you. Or you didn't like the fact that no, none of them say thank you. Or, or someone inferred that they might one day might think about maybe one day possibly smacking you in the face if you talk about Jesus again. But, but they, they just said they're thinking about maybe in 10 years doing it. And you just all that, oh, I'm about to fall back. You've not yet resisted unto blood. So... It's beautiful because the Bible does teach to cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Lord, I'm scared. I'm out here witnessing, and I'm very eloquent at work, but right now, I don't even know my name. I forgot my address. I'm very scared. Help me, oh Lord. Ooh, his strength is made perfect in your weakness. So the Bible teaches, yes, cast all your cares, all your worries. Lord, that person said that they're going to smack me in 10 years. They said they're just thinking about maybe smacking me in 10 years, and they'd get back to me later. Lord, I'm tempted to quit. Would you help me? No, cast that care upon them. Just don't stay stuck there. Consider Jesus before you end up making it like it's the, the biggest, newest story in 2022 martyrdom. You've not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. They used to call Jesus' brother James Camel Knees, church history tells us, because he spent so much time on his knees that they actually came to resemble the knees of a camel calloused over because he was so much on his knees. But you see, when we don't call to remembrance these things, when we don't call to remembrance the scriptures, when we don't call to remembrance what our Lord did, it's like, I'm not going to the prayer meeting. They got pillows there. I don't like the chairs there. I don't, I don't like, you know, I don't know. I, there's a smell. Did you smell something last time we were at the church? I think it was coming from the pantry room. I think there's some old meat in there. I don't like the way, I, I don't like the smells. You've not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So therefore, back to verse 1, seeing we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let's run with patience the race that's set before us. Once again, the writer is likening the Christian battle to athletic competition, to athletic training. And first it's saying, all of those in Hebrews 11, all of those who's gone on before us, and we know enough of the Old Testament to know that they were all flawed men and women, but they were flawed men and women who decided to be men and women of faith, and wanted to cooperate with God's work in their life, 
There are witnesses. The Greek word for witness there is martyr. Martis is the Greek word for witness. They laid down their lives daily. They daily had the temptation to be selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed, and they daily died. That's what makes them martyrs. A martyr is not just taking a bullet for Jesus at one moment in time. A martyr is someone, a witness is someone who actually chooses to die to their own desires, fights to do that daily. That's what Jesus said in Acts 1.8 when he says, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Ju uh, uh, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. There's the Greek word again. You will be my martus, my, my martyrs. You will be those that will be tempted daily to quit. You will be those that are tempted, you know, daily to go to your own comfort zone. You'll be those that'll be tempted daily to want to just kind of do the world's way of things and try to make this, this syncretism between the world and Christianity. But you will choose daily to fight the good fight of faith. And even when you decide after seasons of being selfish that you want to repent and make your latter end greater than your first, you will even then be my martyr. Maybe there's someone here today and you're like, you know what? Man, this is a new message. <laughs> you know, I haven't thought about stuff like this in like 18 years. Well, you can be a martyr today in repenting and saying, you know what, Lord? I got it twisted. I'm walking all around telling people, don't get this twisted, don't get that twisted. I got it twisted. I got the biggest thing twisted. And man, I want to come back to being your disciple. Because you said in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't even do what I say? Lord, I repent. That is being a martyr. That is being a witness. That is laying down your life. Today is the acceptable day to make the decision to follow Jesus more passionately now than you ever have. Forgetting what is behind. Paul said that in Philippians 3. Knowing we still have a long way to go. Knowing we still got hang-ups and issues and baggage and so much stuff that God needs to continue to set us free from. So many parts of our heart that still need to be conquered by his love. But we're making the decision that we're going to forget Philippians 3.13, the past, and we're now going to go forward. Amen. Is there anyone today that just wants to make a decision that you're just going to actually fight the good fight of faith to spend the remainder of your days trying to look at what it looks like to be sold out for Jesus Christ? Amen. And when it says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, that you want to spend the rest of your days knowing what does peace really mean? Peace because I have a Bible open with my favorite coffee, and my bills are all paid, and my bank account is stacked, my retirement, and my job doesn't look like it's on shaky waters, that kind of peace? No, atheists can have that kind of peace. We're talking about a supernatural peace, where when people are around you and hear you speak, it's as though eternity is speaking of peace be still to their soul. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Well, what is joy? that I get to go on the vacation of my choosing two weeks out of a 52-week year, and when I'm there, oh, it feels so great, and I give thanks. This is joy. No, no, no. We're talking about a joy that even in the severest trials, nothing can take it away from you. Amen. A cup that runs over. A cup that rejoices in tribulation, like it says in Romans. He's saying, look, Hebrews 11 is made up of sinful men and women that prove that God will take a rebellious, selfish, self-centered believer who's always trying to twist this thing up to make it our own comfortable form of Christianity and make you into image bearers and people that look like God. That's what Hebrews 11 is proof of. That people who will fail him miserably, because you could read the Old Testament, everyone in Hebrews 11 failed God horribly at some point. But it's proof that even when you fail, his love is bigger than your biggest failures and his grace is sufficient. So we're surrounded by proof. We're surrounded by people that, can, that speak to us through the pages of Scripture and say, yep. God takes sinners and does amazing things. He takes people and conquers all their hereditary circuitry, their philosophical circuitry, their deepest ideologies, and makes them think just like God. Thank you. And is saying, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside every weight. The idea is when a runner is prepping to run in the race, he'll train with weights on. The idea is, even you see today in baseball, before a baseball player gets up to the plate, they're in a batting cage with a bat with a metal ring around the bat, you know, just to give them the extra training. But once it's time to perform, you got to lay those weights aside. It's saying to us, we have to lay aside 
the sin that easily besets us. And what it means in the Greek is the sin that so deftly and so cleverly entangles you. And isn't that the way the sin works? Sin doesn't come and introduce itself like, here I come. I'm sin. Smell me? (laughs) Don't I smell rotten and horrible? I'm sin, and here I am, and here's the idea. No, it always comes with this whole package of how it's all going to be okay. It comes cleverly and deftly, and it says, let's lay aside this. And basically, you have to know this. A winning athlete does not choose only between good and bad. Sometimes we can fall in that trap where I'm going to get rid of everything bad, but everything good is good. Well, that, that decides, you know, are you competing just to compete or are you competing to win? Because a winning athlete, there are plenty of athletes out there that you ask them, they're just out there just to be, they're just out there for the camaraderie, for the unity, and just to run around a little bit and break a sweat. But then you talk to the ones that are out there to win. They're not, when they're training, they're not just choosing between good and bad. They're choosing between better and best. It's not a matter of is this is good or bad. It's a matter of if this is, is this the best for me or not. It's not a matter of, oh, well, this passes Scripture. Scripture allows this. No, is this the best thing for me? Let us lay aside. Because we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside every weight, the sin that so easily besets us, and let's get back to running. Not quitting, running with patience. The idea is endurance, the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, verse 2, the author, the pioneer. It means that This thing called faith that you're now walking by, Jesus is the author of it. The moment you actually believed Jesus who picked you is drawing you by his spirit, is giving you faith, he is the pioneer of your faith walk. Not only that, but he's already written out our script. He's the finisher and the perfecter of it. We're the clay, he's the potter. Looking unto Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. And not only is he our potter, not only is he the author and finisher of our faith, but he actually is our example. Write that in your notes. He's our example of how to continue to press without quitting, even when you're tempted to quit. Even with intense suffering, and we will suffer here. And there's some of you right now that are maybe going through something so deep you can't even put it to words. But the scripture's still coming in and saying, quit talking about quitting. Like he said in Hebrews 10, we are not the quitting type. We are the pushing through type. It says, look at Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, underline that, the joy that was set before him, the joy that was set before him. You see, as Jesus came among us and walked as the God-man, while facing everything as a man totally submitted to God and looking to God for daily bread and daily power, it's saying here that he placed his faith in what God said. Do you really believe that whatever you forsake now that Jesus will reward you with? Do you really believe that Jesus is going to reward us? Do you really believe what he closes the book of Revelation with in Revelation chapter 22, that he actually ends by saying, behold, I come and my reward is with me to give everyone according to their works? Do we really believe this? It says that Jesus came among us and he saw the promises and believed it and rejoiced in them. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Despising the shame, the Greek idea is actually he disregarded it. Meaning, yeah, the cross was excruciating. Did you know the word excruciating actually comes from crucifixion? He went through it. But it's saying that he disregarded it. How how do we? Look, look, let's talk now. The Jewish believers here were really going through some stuff. They were being reproached ostracized, penalized, losing property, losing jobs, losing economic standing. They really were going through it. Nowhere in the Bible is hardship or suffering trivialized. Nowhere do you see God saying to the littlest fear, hey, you know, I'm ignoring you right now. No, he condescends to our every weakness. He gracefully condescends and graciously to our every fear, meets us where we are, but doesn't leave us where we find us. He even comes to the apostle Paul in Acts and says, don't be afraid. 
I know you were just stoned in Lystra, but don't be afraid. I have many people in this city. No one's going to hurt you that way. He does do that. Nowhere does the scripture trivialize our sufferings. But what it does say is there's a way we can disregard it. And how do we disregard it? We disregard it by having our eyes on his promises. We disregard it by having our eyes on the heart of God and the steadfastness and the immovable power of God and his heart for us. It says, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, verse 2, endured the cross, disregarding the shame. You know, it says in Romans 8, 18, Paul wrote this. He said, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the eternal weight of glory that is laid up for us, paraphrase. The Greek word for worthy is actually an accounting term. What he's saying is what God has laid up for us is so amazing that if you try to even put our sufferings on the same scale, the scale would not even budge. It it wouldn't even be worth putting it on the scale. It would insult the scale to think that our sufferings are exceeding what God has for those that love him. So consider Jesus. It proves that God is faithful. Hebrews 11 proves that God is faithful. Hebrews 11 proves that God does not miss every detail of our lives and everything we do for him counts and he sees it. Hebrews 12 is moving on and saying Jesus' example is before us. That even when he went to the cross for us, he disregarded the shame. And he's now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him again, verse 3, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not resisted unto blood striving against sin. And verse 5, you have forgotten. Underline that. You have forgotten. And we could actually get more into this next week, perhaps. You have forgotten the exhortation that speaks unto you as unto children. And now he's going to quote Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. And the idea is disciplines, corrects, and guides. And he even scourges every son that he receives. He will discipline his own children. If you endure, verse 7, this chastening, God is dealing you with sons. For what son is he whom the father does not correct or chasten? But if you be without chastisement, whereof we are all partakers, then you are bastards and not really children. Furthermore, verse 9, we've had fathers, human fathers that corrected us, and we gave them reverence still. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For verse 10, our earthly fathers, for a few days, they punished us after their own pleasure, meaning they punished us with what they felt was right, with their finite minds, but God does it for our profit every time so that we might be made partakers of his holiness. Everything God allows in our life, everything he allows in our life is with perfect, infinite wisdom designed to make us look more like Jesus, that we might be partakers of his holiness and truly enjoy the peace of God, the joy of God, and walk in the power of God. Verse 11, now look, no chastening for the present time is joyous. You don't see anybody saying, oh man, this feels great. I'll liken this to a vacation. It's grievous even, verse 11. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness by them that are exercised thereby. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember when these verses used to mean so much? Do you remember when you would read this and just get so much comfort and you just embrace chastening from God? You embrace God's challenges and love the idea that he was chasing us? Remember when we actually would get excited when we were being chastened because we knew that it showed that we were his sons and proved that we weren't actually bastards? Right? Because the Lord doesn't chasten the ones that have not entered into a covenant relationship with him through Jesus Christ. You ever been in the store and seen a little kid just telling his mom off? screaming, and somebody might think that that was your kid because the kid looks like you, right? You got jeans on, kid got jeans on. You got Timberlands on, little kid got Timberlands on, or you got sandals on, kid got sandals on. You know, you're standing next to, the, looking for the, in the mayonnaise aisle, the little kid's right here. Someone's like, man, 
is that father going to let that kid act like that? But then as the kid's now just throwing glass mayonnaise on the ground and smashing it and sees that you're still just shopping for mayonnaise, they, oh, no, that's not his kid. Because if that was his kid, he would deal with him. Well, it says that the Lord only deals with his children. If there's someone, and even if they say they know Jesus and they're born again, but yet they're able to do whatever they want and they never seem to be getting challenged or chasing for it, it says here in the Word that at that point, that's a good indication that you might be a bastard spiritually and that you're not really his kid because he, he chastens and refines and grows his kids. Got his kids on a short leash. You ever notice that? You can't get away with stuff like you, like, like you wish you could sometimes? You, you're, you can't get away with stuff like your flesh told you you'd get away with it? You can't get away with stuff, right? The conviction, you try to turn the conviction off, you can't turn the conviction off? right? You try to preach a sermon to the conviction, a demonic, diabolical sermon, but you're trying to turn the conviction. All that is indication that you're his. But if you go through all of this, it's an indication if he's not chastening you that you're not his kid. But do you remember when there was a time when we counted it an honor to suffer for him and even rejoiced because the chastening, the challenge, being challenged was actually an indication that he was at work in our life. And we took it as a, as, a, as a comfort. And now today, we take our eyes off Jesus. You challenge somebody, man. Me and Pastor Sherman over the years have developed a joke. Hey, we challenge someone, so you think they'll be here next week? Had to, got to challenge someone. Think they'll leave? That's just today. After 21 years of pastoring, you start to get that kind of an insight. Same way a mother, after having a bunch of kids, can put a hand to the head. Oh, no, you're not fever hot. You've been out in the sun too long hot. You all right. Right? Oh, oh yeah, no, 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 this or that. You know, here, here, move around a little bit. Oh, oh no, no, your bone's not broke. You're all right. Just go lay down for a minute. That, well, the same thing with pastoring. You do this for a while, you just come to see the patterns, and you see how literal the Word of God is. But look at that day we're in. Right? Gotta wonder, you challenge people, they're gonna look for the door. We still gonna see them around? Because we've all taken our eyes off Jesus and we falter and we faint at the slightest little challenge. And it's turning into a Christianity that you don't find in the Bible. And that's what we have to watch out for. Now, do you see why Jesus said to the last day's lukewarm church of Laodicea, You're not hot, you're not cold, but you're lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I have to vomit you out. And the reason that he says he has to vomit out lukewarmness is lukewarmness spreads. So just like God's designed our body to bring food back up so it doesn't spread to all of your body, it stops at the stomach, it gets ejected, lest your whole body get poisoned by it. He's saying, I have to vomit lukewarmness because it spreads. It makes other people want to be lukewarm. Somebody sees someone lukewarm, oh, I'm lukewarm. Well, where's so-and-so? Oh, you know, they're kind of taking off for a few Sundays. They're not in the house of the Lord. Then it makes it easy for someone. Oh, well, so-and-so has been saved longer than me. They're not in church. Well, I'm not going to church. The Lord said, yeah, it spreads. But fire spreads too. And is there anyone here today that wants to decide that you want to spend the remaining years of your walk on fire? Amen. And you might fail. Next week might be your biggest smoke out. But it doesn't change your perspective though. Because, you know, it bees like that sometimes. You stand in church today, Lord, I'm going to be sold out for you, Lord. Woo! I'm, man, bullet, where you at? Sword, where you at? Come, sword, come, bullet. He's worthy. And then, man, tomorrow you might do the most selfish, not craziest thing you've ever done in your whole Christian world. But his mercy is new every morning. And will you still hold to your perspective no matter what? Because our faith is in his enabling. And when we fail, it's just an indication that we just don't have our eyes on him. Oh, boy, I could keep going. So look, verse 12, therefore, in light of all this, lift up those hands that are hanging down. You know, where are your hands at? And this isn't a matter of thing, like, oh, I guess nobody loves the Lord. I don't see no hands raised tonight. I don't see no hands clapping tonight, Right? Oh, some people might have their hands in their pocket, but the hands of their heart are lifting up to the heavens more than ever. This is talking about where the heart is. Are your hands hanging down? Are the, are the praise-giving hands of your heart hanging down? You're doing all the right things on the outside, but where are the hands of your heart? It's saying here, in light of all this, lift them up. Lift up those feeble knees. Verse 13, make straight paths for your feet. 
lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Bring that stuff to the Lord that needs healing today and get the healing you need. Okay, it's great that you've identified all your childhood baggage and that you can pinpoint all your triggers. God, by his work, reveals that kind of stuff to us. But don't forget to slide in the home plate. Home plate is not acknowledging where it comes from. Home plate is not being able to identify your triggers. Home plate is bringing all that to the Lord, knowing he'll heal you and thanking him in advance. What have you been holding on to? Because that's the thing. When we get faint and wearied, and we can have the worship team come up now. When we get faint and wearied, we don't just get faint and wearied in serving. We don't just get faint and wearied in coming to church. We get faint and wearied across the board. We get faint and wearied with bringing our issues to God. We get faint and wearied with bringing to God what needs healing. We get faint and wearied in believing that he's a healer. How many of y'all forgot that God is a healer? How many of y'all forgot that he wants to heal every part of you. He's saying here, bring that stuff to him that, he might be, that it might be healed. And then verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. How can I fail of the grace of God? I fail of the grace of God. Galatians says I frustrate the grace of God when I don't come to God for everything. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus and let's take advantage of mercies new every morning and his grace. What do you need from God today? What words do you have for Jesus today? Look, I've been pastoring for over 20 years and what I love about this thing is it continues to feel like you're just getting started. But look, I'm going to tell y'all, I've been through some stuff. I've had my life threatened many times. I've worried that someone was going to kill me just for serving Jesus. I've been in situations where I didn't know if I'd come back home. I've been betrayed, backstabbed, lied to, taken advantage of. I've developed health conditions for this. Just because you pastor 20 years doesn't mean that you're able to say, I feel like I'm just getting started. If I didn't cooperate with Scripture and keep my eyes on Jesus, I would fall away. You see how many pastors are just hanging it up right now? I'd be another one just hanging it up. Especially in a city like Philadelphia, as tough as it is to serve here. But... I hope that I just show a couple of things. One, that God can do a lot with a sinner, (laughs) okay? A crazy sinner from North Jersey. And two, when you keep your eyes on Jesus, you will continue to mount up with wings as eagles, even when you feel like your wings just got chopped off. You will supernaturally mount up, wings will appear again, and you will walk with hinds feet in high places. It is possible to be doing this thing a long time and to suffer a lot and to still have the childlike joy of the Holy Ghost. But it all comes down to this. Not that, well, some people are wired tougher, some people's childhood prepares them more for this. No, all of us are equally sinners, equally fearful, and equally selfish. It's when you keep your eyes on Jesus Not on church, not on church culture, and not on theology, on the person of Jesus Christ. So the question is today, how much are you really, really looking at Jesus? How much do you really think about the person of Jesus? Not his words, not his methods, not his principles, the person. Because the Bible promises you make the person of Jesus Christ. You fight to keep him at the center of your meditations and you will be able to walk in what Hebrews 12 is calling us to. So, bruh, quit talking about quitting. Let's show a church that is drowning in a quitter culture. The American church is drowning in a quitter culture. Let's be those that show, that can showcase the glory of God through the work of the Holy Spirit in being those that are persuaded in our minds that we are not going to be quitters.
We'll get weak, we'll get scared, we'll huddle up, we'll pray together, we'll encourage one another. I might need the most encouragement in this room next week. Who knows what a week brings? But the perspective has got to be the same. We are not going to be quitters. Father, we just thank you so much for ministering to us, Lord, for meeting us here today, Lord. And God, you're just so amazing. Lord, we're just so sorry with what we do with Christianity. We are so sorry with what we've turned it into. Lord, would you forgive us, Lord? Would you bring us back by your spirit to focusing on you in a world that's pulling our attention in a million different ways? Would you bring us back to what matters? Would you create in us a clean heart right now, Lord? Would you renew a right spirit within us? Lord Jesus, we just want to focus on you and your ways. Lord, we can all give testimony of what happens when we make ourselves the center. Rescue us from that, Lord, by your spirit. We believe you're going to rapture our bodies. Would you rapture us from low thinking? Would you rapture us from religiosity? Would you rapture us from churchianity? And would you bring us to the heart of Jesus? Lord Jesus, you're here in our midst right now. Your word says that you walk in the midst of the lampstands, and we honor you among us, Lord Jesus. We pray that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart will be acceptable in your sight. And we stand before you and we bow before your feet right now. Lord Jesus, would you forgive us for talking to men and not talking to you? Would you forgive us for doing everything except for believing that you're in our midst? Because if we really believed it, so much of what we do would be different. Would you straighten us out, Lord? We want to be like you, Lord. There's nothing more beautiful than you. Forgive us for believing the world's lies, that we could create our own brand of self that can even perhaps rival your work in us. Would you give us a hunger to be wherever your Holy Spirit is working? Would you give us a hunger to be wherever your word is being taught? Would you give us a hunger to be wherever people are lifting up their voices to your name? Would you give us a hunger for the things of God and not just church culture? Would you help us to look like the Apostle Paul and men and women who have laid it all down for you? And can we be encouraged by the witnesses that have gone before us? So, Lord, it's not about us. And we give you the right to convict us when our speech tries to underscore that it is about us. Make us sensitive to the conviction of your spirit again. Paul said, I want to have a conscience that's void of offense towards God and men. Would you give us a heightened sensitivity to when we've offended you, O Lord, or when we've offended our brother or sister? Please help us. We ask for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask that you would receive today's offering as honoring you. It says in Proverbs to honor you with the first fruits of our increase. Of all you give to us, we get to give to you. And Lord, would you use today's offering for the building of your kingdom. We thank you for all the above, and we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.